The 2000s were a magical time in the world of cartoon theories. Practically every show on Cartoon Network was in some way dark, even scary, or just downright bizarre. None more than John R. Dilworth's Courage the Cowardly Dog. You all know the story. Abandoned as a pup, he was found by Muriel, I'm not gonna do the voice, who lives in the middle of nowhere with her husband Eustace Bag. But creepy stuff happens in nowhere. It's up to Courage to save his new home. God, I love that. Shows like The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack, Ed, Ed, and Eddie, and even Nick's Invader Zim were all in such strangely unique worlds to begin with that theorizing about certain details was always going to be par for the course. I miss those days, so why not go back through history and curate them all? Starting with my adorable friend and lovable pooch, Courage Bag. He and his owners here are no stranger to the world of theories, but not all of them are worth their weight. So today, we'll be going over five popular Courage theories, and a little one of my own. Yes, if you read the title, the video is about debunking the popular creepy ideas about the show, but don't misunderstand me and think I don't love some good speculation. If a theory holds water and can withstand some scrutiny, I won't think twice about giving it a pass or even some praise. But as any good curator should be, I'm picky, and I'm going to be looking at these topics under a fine, fine microscope today, starting with one I'm sure many of you are familiar with if you're into this kind of thing. And that will be what I call realism theory, sometimes known online as from a dog's perspective. Like the name implies, this theory states that Courage doesn't actually live in a fantasy world, but is really just a hyperactive, very anxious dog, and all of the varied monsters and ghouls we see throughout the series are actually just regular people, seen through his perspective. The perspective of a dog owned by elderly people, who was never properly socialized. I think this theory is so popular because it's simple and easy to explain, it's pretty clickbaitable, and it's kind of hard to debunk for an average fan. To be honest, the idea is so novel that when you hear it, you might just think, huh, well, that's pretty cute. Makes sense, too. And then you go about your day because you have better things to do than talk about cartoons with a little pink moth. But if you're someone like me who kind of gets like a little unhingedly obsessed with media, you probably instantly called bullshit on this whole perspective theory here. At a glance, this idea does sound kind of plausible. For instance, a key piece of evidence for this is that the bags don't literally live in the middle of nowhere, but Courage is so sheltered that he just can't imagine anything outside of the house. But... I think these people aren't exactly getting the joke. Nowhere is the name of the town they live in. A descriptive one, yes, but a name nonetheless. And what about the barn outside, or the chicken coop, or the windmill? Courage chills outside quite a bit, actually. And not only this, but there's a city in the world of Courage. Multiple of them, in fact, and Courage comprehends them just fine. Sure, the scary bug man Schwick could be Courage hallucinating an evil man to look like this thing, but I think it's far more likely Schwick here is an actual giant roach. Firstly, because this is why the show is so hilarious. Muriel and Eustace are so old that they can't tell the person they're talking to is actually like a demon or zombie or Bigfoot or whatever. Muriel hardly ever knows she's in any danger to begin with, except for when she does. Ooh. But that right there is more evidence against this theory. Sometimes this stuff is real to them too. How would you explain this under realism theory? Are they actually getting mugged in the real world and tied up and kidnapped to be eaten? This theory is just kind of stupid. It sucks all the charm out of this show. If you want some more evidence against its validity though, look no further than the fact that there are all kinds of normal people that we see Courage interact with. Yes, you can live in a bubble and say kitty and cats and all the animal people are actually just regular people or even animals that Courage is seeing through his unreliable vision, but that doesn't explain the human population of nowhere and its surrounding cities. Characters like D. Lung, Fred, Dr. Zalos, the King of Flan, the General, all the army guys, Dr. Vindaloo, and more. I think that's enough of the realism theory to be debunked for me. I could keep going, but there's a lot more I want to do. I want to show you guys the cool, obscure stuff that you've never heard of before. But before we get there, we gotta speedrun the basic stuff first. And a good place to find that slob is the Fan Theories Wiki, which has a whopping three for Courage. Come on guys, this is Courage the Cowardly Dog we're talking about. Three? Isn't this what you do? What even are these other two theories? Oh my god. Ugh, oh, fine, but let's get this over with quick. Cerberus theory. For those uninitiated, every single cartoon has at least one theory about the show being in hell, or purgatory, or all the characters being dead, so on and so forth. It's annoying. And the so-called evidence for this iteration regarding Courage is pathetic. Here it is. Nowhere is a barren wasteland, so it's actually HELL, guys! And Eustace is mean, so he's actually SATAN! And Courage is Cerberus, because he protects his evil masters! Bah! I hope that was good, because I'm not doing that twice. I mean, I know this show's target audience, but that has the depth of an essay written by a first grader. 
Also, how dare you infer that Muriel is some kind of agent of the devil? That woman is a saint. And if Eustace is Satan, why does he end more episodes burnt to a crisp or beheaded than he doesn't? My immediate thought was, Cerberus has three heads though. Their explanation of this discrepancy is that, well, well courage shapeshifts when he tells stories and sometimes he has more than one head. I mean, I mean, that's gotta be close enough, right? No, bad. Your theory sucks, kid. What's next? Fusilli theory, huh? A classic. So this is the first one that requires actual context because there's for real like evidence in a case to be made. The great Fusili is a traveling performer who stops at the Bag residence late one night. From here on out, a regular Courage plot ensues. Courage is scared shitless of this magic crocodile for 11 minutes, and Muriel and Eustace stay as ignorantly close to danger as humanly possible without dying. Well, except for Eustace. Except, that's not exactly right. That's how a normal episode would go. The Great Fusilli is no ordinary episode. It's actually season one's finale. This is really significant, more so for Courage than most other shows. Courage the Cowardly Dog, as you probably know, is weird. It's honestly really strange to market horror to children in this way so brazenly. This show isn't as whimsical or sing-songy as something like Nightmare Before Christmas or Casper the Friendly Ghost. This is some real scary shit. John R. Dilworth was constantly pushing the bar and trying to move the goalpost to get CN to let him do half the stuff Courage did. And some of it looked straight out of the mind of David Firth. It was ballsy, and they had no clue if it would be marketable at all. For most involved, initially, a season 2 seemed unlikely at best, so they wanted to go out with a bang, and made Fusilli's story end a little bit different from the rest. Fusilli in his magic stage have the uncanny ability to turn anyone who does one of his performances into a puppet that he can add to his collection. In typical Courage fashion, Eustace and Muriel get turned into these puppets. Courage steals them, then forces Fusilli to do his own sick performance. He becomes one of his own golems, soon to be a lifeless chunk of painted wood. Our episode ends with Courage hopping off Muriel's wooden lap to run up the stairs and puppet them. We hear them talk, but we can tell it's just Courage doing impeccable ventriloquism. Back in 1999, this is where Courage's story ended. It was crazy! And thank god we got a season 2 and the whole family was back to normal. Or... was it? Enter Fusilli Theory. Is the entire rest of the show after this point Courage having a psychotic breakdown while puppeting his two owners? Hell no! Okay, on to the next one. Huh? Oh, come on. Whatever. I actually found an excellent post on DeviantArt of all places, fully going over why this theory needs to be stopped dead in its tracks. So thanks to Dandy Andy1989 for going over this point by point. He mentions how this kind of thing has happened before, with the family being turned into objects at the end of Club Cats. Eustace dies all the time at the end of episodes. Courage ends at least four episodes seemingly forever changed into something else. And while yes, this is the only time Muriel meets that same bizarre ending, why is that really special? The reason it was any different at all, like I said, was that John probably thought that this could be the end, and wanted the show to end in a really weird way that would get people talking forever. And it was even maybe kind of a sly way to get the show renewed. Like, hey, Cartoon Network, you're not gonna let the old couple die as puppets, right? Pretty please give us a season two, pretty please. And hey, it worked. If you want an in-universe explanation, Courage most likely contacted Shirley the medium for help, or just referred to his trusty, albeit dickish, computer upstairs. Believe it or not, I managed to buy the thing off Shirley herself at this weird auction back home. It was exciting. They're about as exciting as a sack of toenail clippings. Hey, shut up. You're part of my collection now, forever. No need to get testy, you insect. Insect? Yuck! I wouldn't want them in my house. Whoa, that is not cool! Got you rattled, snowflake. Some people can't take a joke. Dick, let's just move on. Even twits can have good ideas, sometimes. Okay, so for this one, we need to talk not about television, but real life. This is William Patterson and his wife Margaret, a couple living in a small rural house in El Paso. When Margaret hadn't picked up her dry cleaning in days, the owner reported it to the police, who found their house empty, except for their small, scared dog. At least that's how the story goes. This is the photo attached. Ooh. First of all, this photo is not their house. This was taken by Lotus Carroll in 2013. The real Patterson house is here, and if you want to know what happened to them, I have no clue. The government thought they were Russian spies. I think that's an excuse for not being great at solving murders and hating Russians, but what do I know? Can't have a pizza summit without pizza. No can do, sir. But if you're like me and you're curious as to the actual origins of Nowhere, as in its inspiration, Dilworth has said it's a combination of things. 
He himself has had a strange experience out at a house not unlike that of the bags. He said he was young and he and his girlfriend were out on a trip with some family and had seen a ball of light appear outside right in front of them only to suddenly vanish. According to him, quote, I started writing the story of the alien chicken the next day. And that was Courageous Pilot. He's also been credited as saying Dorothy Lange's Dust Bowl photos were a big inspo, specifically Dust Bowl Farm, taken in Texas. Studio Ghibli's world building and fantasy aspects were also something John had been quoted citing. And let's not forget the main one. Creepy stuff happens in nowhere. If you ask anybody who's lived on a farm for decades, I'm sure they'll have at least one or two creepy tales about their property. In America, you always hear ghost stories and tales of Bigfoot and UFOs and stuff, and it's always just some old couple on a farm telling their story. And with that, our fourth topic, origin theory, is debunked. But if it did anything, it solidified the idea that Courage's setting is almost certainly in the southern USA, most likely Texas near the Gulf of Mexico. At least, that's what I thought, until a quick Google search told me that Courage takes place in nowhere, Kansas. So that makes this theory twice as debunked. I'm not positive where Wikipedia got this forbidden knowledge that all this is in Kansas, though. Am I a fake fan and don't remember the episode where Courage goes, The things I do for Kansas? I couldn't find a source, so honestly, I'm not sure what to believe anymore. Our next theory, known as Skinwalker Theory, is something I found on fellow cryptic topic channel Blame It On Jorge. Jorge compares Courage's story to a different horrific case in the Gulf area, this time much, much darker. This is another house, eerily similar to that of the bags. This old shack is located in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, and was a place often used by the infamous serial killer David Parker Ray, also known as the Toy Box Killer. The reason this is called Skinwalker Theory is because of the already existing myth in the Texas area, so when all of these children started going missing, David Parker Ray's victims, it was originally attributed to the mythic cryptid. Now, really, this isn't the right time to get into a full-blown true crime story, but Ray, who's suspected of having up to 60 to 80 victims, ended a plethora of lives in this house. What's the connecting thread to Courage the Cowardly Dog, you might ask? Well, that would be found in Ray's method of getting into his victims' homes. Two of his most common methods were knocking on the door with a sob story, hoping to be let in out of sympathy, and knocking on the door promising people money, fame, and lying about his credentials. This is a little spooky. I mean, of course it's terrifying. But these are two of the most common ways Courage victims get into the bag's house in Courage. Muriel always folds at a sob story, and Eustace would do anything for fame and wealth. While this idea is chillingly interesting, I don't really subscribe to it. As we found over the course of this video, there's gotta be thousands of houses that look just like this, and we've already gone over John's inspiration for Courage. Although, if it was something this dark, I'm not sure he'd want to be too public about it, seeing as he wants to continue Courage's IP. This one is, I guess, our most believable so far, but, like, barely. Come on, do we have anything else? Let's get weird! I'm surprised there aren't more readily available theories about this show, and if I wasn't trying to upload a video every week, I would go painstakingly pick through the show itself instead of foraging for mysteries online. I have a theory about the show that I've been personally crafting, but I don't have enough time to watch 52 episodes of Courage to debunk it or not. I'll call my idea Master Theory, because what I think is that most, or at least some, of the Courage villains have some sort of secret master plan, meaning there's a reason that Courage and the Bags are being targeted by all of these entities. My biggest question is, who exactly is the target? Is it Courage? Muriel? Eustace? Or even the house itself? My current answer is kind of all of them, but mostly the last two. Starting with the latter, we know the house is haunted. Computer here tells us that in one episode, the house was built over a cemetery, and we even see bodies get reanimated here. Dead bodies, just feet underneath their dirt floored basement. We also know the windmill outside is haunted with a curse to ward away the vengeful spirits of the windmill vandals placed on the structure by the home's previous owner. So now we also know that the house was owned previously by some kind of like witch or spellcaster or something who is probably all kinds of haunted themselves. Eustace also most likely plays a massive part in bringing demons to this home, firstly and obviously because of his overwhelming negative energy, but also his dead brother, Horst. Horst is an enigmatic character, being an archaeologist who has strange connections to the otherworldly. This framed photo the family has of him is a picture of him celebrating killing some kind of tentacled monster, and the box of money he left after his death that Eustace tries to open is actually the fucking prison realm with a horrifying faceless deity that tries to crawl out of its abyss. The more and more I think about this master theory, the more I think that it might all be Eustace's fault. Perhaps all the money-hungry villains in Courage, which is a lot of them, are after Horst's fortune that they think could belong to Eustace. Little do they know, the late Horst hated his little brother. You know what? This is 
This is used as theory now, because yeah, I remember that the villains of Courage have worked together once before on screen in the terrible episode The Ball of Revenge. In this episode, some of Courage's worst foes show back up to beat Courage in dodgeball because they hate him so much, I don't know. But what I didn't immediately remember is that the real plot of this episode is that Eustace was the one who called them all together. Maybe Eustace does have money, but is simply greedy and just doesn't spend any of it. Maybe he paid them all to be here, and maybe he pays people to mess with his dog more than we think. Then, wayward freaks from all over nowhere start hearing about an old man who pays people to scare his dog, which gets even more people showing up to cause chaos. This is kind of incredibly damning, largely because how did Eustace contact these people? Like, Eustace wasn't even in the episode with the Cajun Fox, so how did he track him down? Eustace always has his head in his newspaper, but is he actually paying more attention than we think? Eustace ends a lot of the episodes that these characters come from dead, so how would he have even remembered who they were to contact them? There's something going on here. This video is getting long, so I don't have much longer to theorize, but I'd like to give all of Courage a rewatch with this idea in mind and see what I can dig up. If you can't tell, I think I'd like to make a whole video about this Eustace theory. I think it could go pretty deep. I may even be able to find the reason Eustace can seemingly die over and over again, or walk around like a chicken with his head blown off. It's always been clear Eustace is Courage's main antagonist, but maybe his reign over the series and Nowhere is more direct than we'd think. Comment down below what you think. Are there any theories that I missed? Send in enough and this video could get a sequel. What cartoons theories should I debunk next? Ed Ed Nettie, Camp Laszlo, Spongebob? And I'm gonna be honest, I had no plans to work on another Courage video so soon, but this Eustace theory is really calling my name. I apologize my conclusions weren't as satisfying as you'd maybe hoped, but I'm not sure what you expected from a debunking video. Maybe every time we do one of these debunking cartoon videos, we'll pick the very, very best one and give it its own full depth analysis on the channel. I like that idea. And if you do too, subscribe. There will definitely be more like this in the future, without a doubt. I'd really like to keep going, but the truth is, if I keep talking, this won't go up on time. And time management is important to us curators. It's just another thing to organize. Thank you for watching, ladies and gentlemen, and stay curious. What a loser.